Uh, and I would also point out that, uh, he, as I like to say, he's a fellow bucket man. I'm from the uh, east side of Pawtucket. He's from the west side of Pawtucket. And it's commonly referred to as the bucket. I will tell you that um, when I told my wife uh, that this session was entitled The Art of Listening, she was overjoyed. <laughs> and she said, you better pay attention. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to have Chris take us through this. Obviously, communications is a big part of what we do, and it's becoming increasingly more and more uh, significant to, to how school districts get their message out and how they receive input from the, the public. So with, uh, without that, well, further ado, Chris, you want to take over? Thanks, Tim. Good morning. It's great to be back. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Tim. I've spoken to where I asked on a few different occasions, both in person and, of course, virtually. Um, so it's nice to be back. As Tim mentioned, I, uh, I live in Massachusetts now. I've been here, up, up in Massachusetts for almost 30 years as of next week. Uh, but I did grow up in Rhode Island, grew up in Pawtucket. I've got to establish my Rhode Island street cred here before we go any further. Um, I'm the son of an educator. My mother worked in public and parochial schools uh, here in Rhode Island throughout her career. In fact, I didn't get to mention this to my friends from Bristol Warren, but she told me the other day she was the first speech therapist ever hired in Bristol Warren back in the late 60s. So. And she spent most of the end, last part of her career, 25 years, at the Rhode Island School for the Deaf. So I've grown up not just in education from my own experience, but very much around the dinner table as well. Um, and in the last five or six years, I've had a chance to come back to Rhode Island quite a bit to, to work with districts here, uh, primarily in the East Bay on school referendum, school building construction referendum projects. Uh, lots of COVID work over the last couple of years and other projects. So it's been great to come back to my hometown. My family still lives here and uh, I spend a lot of time here. So always nice to have an excuse to come back. So thanks for having me. Uh, today we are talking about the art of listening. Um, and as it's a phrase probably familiar to most, if not all of you, um, I will start off by saying that I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist. There are plenty of folks with those credentials who have written books and articles about the art of listening. Sometimes, as Tim alluded to, they are in the context of personal relationships and how we all need to become better listeners. And sometimes they're in the context of behavior and professional settings. And today we're going to explore what that means for those of us in K-12. Um, so to start off, I'm going to share a video with you, uh, a short clip of a gentleman who is also not a sociologist or a psychologist, but a researcher, an author, and a speaker whose studies have primarily been in anthropology, but he's written a lot about the art of listening. And let me see if this will play. No, it will not. So I'm going to go manual here. Hard to listen if you don't play the audio, right? If you're trying to lose belly fat, stop doing cardio. No extra charge for the ad. So listening is not the act of hearing the words spoken. It is the art of understanding the meaning behind those words. Um, and uh, you know, when people say, you're not listening to me, and we simply parrot back the words that they were said, congratulations, your ears work. You know, that, is the act, that is the act of listening. Um, but the art of listening is, is creating an environment in which the other person feels heard. Now you notice what I said there. The other person, and I used an emotional word, feels, right? I don't want to know that you heard the words. I want to feel, I want to feel heard, I want to feel seen, I want to feel understood. And that is a learnable, practicable, learnable, practicable skill. So it's, uh, there are many parts of it. It's things like replacing judgment with curiosity, right? That's a hard thing to do. We're a pretty judgy group, right? Um, to be curious where someone has a point of view. It's creating a safe space for someone to, as my, as my friend Dia Khan calls it, empty the bucket. So even if we find what they're saying just reprehensible, right? you're never going to be able to actually have dialogue until at least one of the parties gets the opportunity to say everything without judgment. And, it, and as she calls it, emptying the bucket. And once person, somebody feels like they've completely said everything, then they're more apt to listen to you. But usually what we do is we defend, or we litigate, or we interrupt. We point out flaws in logic, which is just frustrating. And when you point out some flaws in somebody's logic, because we're all imperfect when we speak, and we all choose the wrong words at various times. And that's not what I meant. You know what I meant. This is what we have to say. Well, wait, if you know what you meant, then why don't you say what you You can see how this spirals. 
Um, uh, um, but it's things like when somebody says something, you know, and there, there's really easy ways to do it. Things like, go on, tell me more. What else? And they keep talking. And you go quiet, and you feel the space. And tell me more. Go on. And eventually, it's all out. And then you, there's a safe space for you to respond or to. So the gentleman's name is Simon Sinek. It's a really interesting piece that goes on for a bit. But I really like what he has to say about sort of rethinking our notion of what listening even is. That I think sometimes we think, well, yes, of course I was listening. I heard exactly what you said. That's very different than listening in a meaningful way, where not only you are listening and, and processing what you've heard deeply, but also making the person feel heard. So what does this mean for those of us in K-12? Um, why talk about the art of listening? What does it mean for all of you as school committee members, elected officials, public servants? I want to start just by asking you what some of the mechanisms are, some of the venues and systems that are in place now for you to listen to your constituents. What are some, what are some of those ways? Uh, Emily, public comment, everyone's favorite, right? Yes. Emails. Emails. So not taking listening too literally, it doesn't have to be the spoken word, but lots of written communication too, whether emails or good old snail mail, what else? Yeah. Surveys. surveys, surveys, polls, questionnaires, all of those ways that we gather information from the masses. Telephone, there's a good one. And now we have to add Zoom to the mix, right? <laughs> ways that we hear it from people. Any other? Social media, maybe, maybe a close second for everyone's favorite behind public comment, right? <laughs> Lots of talking going on there, plenty of space in which to listen. Was that yours? No, somebody else had a hand. Any others? Yeah. Just being out and about. Ah, just being out and about. I was just going to the supermarket to grab some milk. I didn't want to talk about SEL in aisle seven for 20 minutes, right? <laughs> but it happens. It's part of the job. Any others? Yeah, we have workshop models that are different than public models. Oh, good. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, I should probably grab a mic. Hold on. She said we have workshop models that are different than, thanks, Travis that are different than regular good old school committee structured meetings. Thanks, Meg. Sure, no problem. So uh, we have, um, for our, each of our strategic plan columns, we have a separate workout, worksheet, workshop, can't talk today. Um, so like we just had one on SEL and our goals there. In that situation, we have a general presentation at the beginning and then everybody breaks into smaller tables with a principal at each table and they talk about what their goals are at that table and the, the school committee members are there broken up into smaller bits, but also the public is welcome to interact with the administrator and hear what the goals are and then give feedback at that site. Um, would we love to have more input? Yes, but, you know, <laughs> but the opportunity is there. <laughs> That's awesome, thank you. Any other districts do something like that, where you sort of break away from the school committee agenda structure and just have a more open dialogue about specific topics? Somebody must, yeah? No? Yeah, you guys do. Good, we're gonna come back to that later in the session, because we've done something similar in Boston that I wanted to share with you as well. It's a lot like what you just described. Um, so, there's no question that we live in intense times, shall we say, um, and you all know far too well um, that we are living in times where there's a lot of shouting going on and maybe not a lot of listening. <laughs> at least that's how I perceive it. Um, and a lot of that shouting happens to take place uh, at school board meetings and school committee meetings here and around the country. Uh, and those are where some of the most contentious issues of our time play out. And even if they don't seem to be ostensibly about schools, they ultimately become about schools because that's how we politicize things. Whether it's over critical race theory, trans kids, LGBTQ issues in general, mask debates. New York Times had a great piece about America's school board meetings are getting weird and scary. I'm sure you can all relate to that dynamic. Um, here's a first person from a school board member in Denver saying, I voted for masks in my school. I worried for my safety after. Literally death threats for school committee members around the country. Um, all these issues uh, that emerged through Black Lives Matter and COVID, whether or not to keep school resource officers in place, I'm sure you're familiar with the debacle that NSBA got involved in, um, in terms of how to even describe some of this pushback from parents. And what does this mean for politically, from a political standpoint? 
there seems to be this notion that the right has made it a key part of its strategy to make school boards the place they're going to take over and to make local policy aligned with their own political views. Um, it's a very old tactic that seems to be resurrected. Um, and of course, there's also efforts at the state level where school boards suddenly become sort of not even the arbiters of what gets taught in their schools if states pass things like don't say gay and banning books and other statewide measures that have a huge impact on schools overnight. So there is this very serious and I think very scary movement afoot um, to take over our school boards uh, with some rather radical viewpoints that may not align with our values. Just this week there was this story in the 74 million the hate is just too much. Threatened by neighbors and trolled on social media, Minnesota school board members are quitting in record numbers. I think this year alone they've seen something like six times more resignations than they would see in a typical year. And it's not just COVID burnout, it's stuff like this. So that's all happy news, isn't it? Aren't you glad you invited me to cheer you up on this Saturday afternoon? Anyway, this is stuff you all know, you feel it every day. And I do want to pause and just commend you for your service, and I don't say that lightly, because I know that this is a hard job, period, let alone what you are going through in the last two years between COVID and all these other hot button issues that are making everyone so much more on edge and making your meetings and your business so much more complex and I'm sure at times downright exhausting. So effective communication. I, I love being able to catch the, the last part of the session before this one. There's so much overlap, as you know, and the previous two speakers spoke a lot about conflict resolution, obviously, but also the role that listening plays in all of that. So it was a nice segue into what we're going to talk about in this session. So when I think about effective communication, I think when most of us think about effective communication, certainly the reason that districts often hire me is because they want to communicate better. And that means different things to different districts. Some superintendents and school committees will say, we want to get better headlines in the press. We want to do a better job telling our story, getting our message out, our website's a mess, we're not using social media well. All of these things about pushing out our message, all the messages we want to deliver, and what do we want to say to our community about the work we're doing so they know how hard we're working and how great our schools are. And that's important, I love that work. It's probably 99% of what I do. But we also know that communication is not just that one-way street. And in fact, communication, effective communication is a two-way street. And we have to get better individually, collectively, and as a sector at reminding ourselves about this, because I, I think we tend to fall down on this arena. And we don't always do a good enough job of really listening. Okay. So let's start with school committee meetings, because it's, it's been brought up, of course. And this is, of course, the first thing we think of, I think, when we think about the venues in which we hear from our constituents. It is a very rigid mechanism, there's no question. Um, each of you has some leeway in your own communities about how you structure your public comment period. It's interesting to note that as far as I know, it's not even required by law to have public comment. Uh, you have to, open meeting law dictates that people can be there, but it is you who have set the boundaries about what people can say, or at least the, the ways in which they say it. And it's really important, I think, now more than ever to be really clear about what those rules are in your town, and maybe even to revisit them and see if they're appropriate for the times in which we live. But to be very clear, and, and some districts even state this right at the beginning of their public comment period about what the public comment period is. Some of you have general public comment as well as public comment on action items and maybe even other venues for that kind of thing. But also to spell out for the audience what the parameters are. So your bylaws may say we have the right to set aside 30 minutes for public comment if we want. We have the right to extend beyond that. We can give each speaker three minutes or on limited time, whatever it may be. But whatever your rules are, making them really clear to the public. When I was working for the school committee in Boston many years ago, we actually just put a little one pager together about school committee meetings. Because we realized people were showing up not really knowing the mechanics of how this works. So part of that was explaining to them in writing what public comment was all about, what was allowed, what was not allowed, some of those norms, but also just explaining each sort of piece of the agenda so that people understood and could follow along with the meeting more closely if they were new to this. I think what's tricky about these public comment periods, as you know, if we look back at what Simon Sinek was talking about, it doesn't leave a lot of room for all that uh, art of conversation, shall we say, or active listening, as he was describing. I could, I could imagine some of you would be laughing if you imagined taking Simon's tips, and during public comment you were saying, go on. 
Let me hear more about this. If anything, we're like, oh, for the love of God, wrap up. <laughs> so it's not the best venue for that kind of thing, nor is it designed to be. And because of that, my advice to districts is always to leave public comment as a one-way street. It's the public's chance to talk at you. Some districts I know have a chance for school committee members to respond to public comment, to either rebut or comment, answer questions. For me and for the school committees I've worked with, it seems like that's a recipe for disaster. My advice, and this worked well for us in Boston, in many, many, many heated school committee meetings, is let public comment run its course. Let people say their piece, rein them in if they're overstepping with threats or anything really inappropriate, but let them say their piece. And your job during all of that is to listen. And I mean really listen. And let the speaker know that you are listening. You're not on your phone. You're not looking at your other members or on your laptop. You are actively listening, looking the speaker in the eye, and not rolling your eyes, not looking sideways at your colleague saying, oh, here we go with this one again. <laughs> and really being as dispassionate as possible while letting them know you're listening. Um, it's, it's hard, I know, especially when these things go on for hours and hours and you want to jump out of your seat, especially if people are stating falsehoods or, or stating things that are simply misleading. Um, my advice is not to use that period as a chance to go back and forth with anyone because it's a slippery slope. And you also want to be incredibly fair, answer or don't want to answer, and maybe, maybe wondering why did that person get an answer and I didn't. So to me, the one-way street is a better way to go there. Now, if that's the case, obviously that doesn't suffice as sort of these opportunities to really give and take, like, like our colleague was describing. We're talking about some of the ways we can do that without relying on school committee meetings. Because school committee meetings, as you know, they are business meetings. Their purpose is to get things done in your district. Sometimes you're voting, sometimes you're just getting updates, but public comment is not the driver of those meetings. So I want to make sure the tail doesn't wag the dog. I want to pause there. I'll give people a chance to react to or push back or ask questions, anything I just said relative to public comment or school committee meetings in general, because I know everyone has a slightly different take on this. Yes. Oh, sorry. Diana. Yes. Just acknowledging, so um, I'm from Westerly, and we've been dealing with all this stuff, too. But one of the things that I find very frustrating, and I don't think there's anything that can be done about it is before public comment, the first public comment, we, we say agenda items only. The second one, you can come up and talk about whatever you want, but we do have time limits. But, you know, part of my statement that I read is, you know, please don't degrade anyone. Don't do this. Don't do that. But there's nothing you can do. They can basically say whatever, whatever they want. And um, the, the only time I think you can do anything about that is when somebody becomes, you know, physically threatening. But other than that, I don't know of anything we can do to control that. Interesting point. I have some thoughts, but I'm wondering if your colleagues want to react to that. Any of you else feel like you have some tips to share or do you feel so equally we helpless? Have a, we have a very specific policy both about respect and what can't be talked about. So personnel, contracts, uh, litigation, those are the obvious one, but if someone's starting to be disrespectful or, you know, talking about somebody else, I'll roll them out of order. And I've kind of had to do that a couple times, but, and it's confrontational, but I think in the, you know, final analysis, that's what you have to do. Thank you. Other thoughts? Other chairs in the room who have the unfortunate job of holding the gavel and having to moderate this circus? <laughs> Megan? I just wanted to say, so we just went to a Hassenfeld program where they talked about, and, and he basically, he, a parliamentarian, a, a, he said, you can't limit it. Like, there's you no, you cannot, because it's a First Amendment right, right? It's a, and, and so this is where I was like, I felt like I was kind of like hit in the face when he said that. So I'm curious what people think, because he really made the argument that anybody can say whatever they want in public comment. It's, it's freedom of speech. And for you to limit it anyway, we do have those rules. We say you cannot speak about a person or a child or anything like that. And that seems kind of just general civility. Um, but uh, he made the argument not. So I'm curious if people have had experience with that. I'm curious too. What do you all think? 
First Amendment, can I say whatever I want at school committee meetings? <laughs> what a loaded question that was, huh? Lynn. I chair the policy subcommittee, and we're discussing right now changes to our bylaws that are affecting good and welfare because we had a very abusive meeting. And our lawyers have told us that, yes, you have to be very careful of the First Amendment, and I understand that. I'm a lawyer myself. But the bottom line is you can still put reasonable limits on what's going on in a public meeting. You can put a time limit. We decided to limit our public uh, good and welfare to five minutes. She suggested 30 minutes total. We ruled against that because that only allows six speakers. That doesn't seem fair. Um, that seems to me really limiting the amount of time by limiting the amount of speakers. That's maximum First Amendment violation to me. But you can set ground rules for that conversation. And the chair has a gavel for a reason. And if the communication is becoming abusive, the chair needs to use that gavel, call someone out of order. That is not violating their First Amendment. At our meeting, we were, John and I were both threatened with physical violence. And at that point, I'm sorry, First Amendment's out the window. Yeah. Um, I thought our SRO should have removed them. He chose not to, but that's what I thought should have happened. But you can put reasonable limits on the nature of that conversation. I was at that, that hasn't felt too, and I'm like, no, sorry. <laughs> One of the things that we did, very similar, had a very, it was a mask meeting, in, and this is where the entire board had to work together, and we worked with the chair. We recessed. We said, guys, we're not going to continue this meeting if we can't be respectful. We want to hear from you. We will listen. Everyone's going to be treated fairly, but we will recess, and we will not continue. So that is another tool that you can use. And, and sadly, I think it's becoming more and more important to have security folks at these meetings, if you don't already. I mean, God only knows what's going to happen, but uh, things can get out of hand quickly. I think it's important to say that you also are within your rights to shut down some commentary, even, be, even if it's not threatening or incredibly impassioned. There are lines that people can't cross from the microphone. And I've seen chairs who are very good at doing that and chairs who are not as good at doing that, of saying the second you are off topic, especially if this is public comment on action items, and you're suddenly going off about which textbooks we're using, you just say, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not on the agenda tonight. And if they don't want to wrap up, then you wrap them up. Uh, easy for me to say. If, the, if, there's a, if school committee is a thankless job, chair is even more <laughs> thankless, right? Um, I was, but it's also important to keep in mind that the risks of not doing that. I'm working with a district right now where at a public comment, a parent got up and started complaining about the accommodations that a student was getting in one of the schools for special ed. That student happens to be the child of a school committee member. And the chair did not shut it down. So now they're being barraged, rightly so, I would say, from parents saying, why was that not shut down? You cannot get up and talk about any kid, even your own, <laughs> unless you really want to. But um, that's not a space for us to talk about individual educational plans, let alone any child, whether she's the daughter of a school committee member or not. So I just want to be clear, this, this is not just about safety and escalation, it's also about putting some boundaries on the content. And I give you chairs a lot of credit for being able to do that. It's not a job I would want. Although I will tell you, when I was in Boston, my job for oh, a good five years was the timekeeper of public comment. So I'd wake up in the middle of the night going, what am I remaining? We just, <laughs> A lot of PTSD from that still, but <laughs> we're working through it. Yes? Please. So, so on that issue, um, we do give the ground rules for behavior, but um, enforcing them is something else. Yeah. And it would be really nice, because if, if I were to shut somebody down, the next thing we'll get is a complaint to the AG's office. So it would be know. really nice, oh, we, we yeah. would. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if it would be a, fi a finding, but we'd get a complaint. It would be really nice if we could get something from the state that just says, since this is going on in all these districts, wasting all this time, to say, um, no, you're not, you're not going to get slammed for this. Because believe me, I will start telling people, don't talk to my people like that. Don't talk to me like that. You're done. Yeah. I would love to. Tim, put you on the spot. Do you have any thoughts about? Any of this with respect to what the state can do or did not do to give folks cover? Um, I, you know, there's really, it's really hard because it's very subjective as to what constitutes bad behavior. Um, sitting at your table, the Smithfield School Committee will tell you that they've had someone show up with zip ties 
prepared to make a citizen's arrest. Lovely. And it was, it was uh, Chief St. Sauvier of the Smithfield Police Department that explained what an actual arrest was to him. And then he understood that he was at, at risk of being actually arrested himself. <laughs> uh, so that curbed that behavior. The, the problem is, you know, the state has no ability to regulate what happens in public comment. And you don't have to have it. I mean, there's no state law that says that you have to have public comment. And in the past, sometimes that's led to some problems with uh, the open meeting law. Because, you know, somebody will bring up a topic, you know, let's replace the gym roof in the, the high school. And that becomes the topic and everybody discusses it. And someone on the committee says, well, let's take a vote on that. Well, that's a violation <laughs> of the open meeting law. So, you know, engaging in the public, and I think Chris has got this right, you know, you, you, you're like a sponge, you know, so you hear it, um, you're best not to react to it because it just kind of engages people more. But there are no, you know, I mean, unless it's a blatant threat against your health and safety or the health and safety of somebody in the school department, there's not really a whole lot that, that they can do. I mean, you know, we had trouble uh, even with law enforcement in some communities enforcing mask mandates in public buildings and public schools. One police chief said, I don't know why I have to do it. <laughs> because it's the law, it's what it is. <laughs> um, so it, it's really difficult in that sense. Y you almost have to roll with it. Uh, I think Westley's taken the right approach to kind of managing the public comment the best way they can, which is to kind of like say, you know what, you might not like it, but our business is recognizing student achievement our business is congratulating teachers that are retiring. Our business is approving field trips. Our business is taking a look at budget items. And then we'll get to public comment. And then at the end of the day, some of them may not want to stick around. Why would they want to stick around and hear about student achievement when they really <laughs> want to just go after you? So I think the other thing that bears, that's worth saying here is while I'm advising against sort of this any back and forth or using public comment time to state your case or defend yourselves, that doesn't mean you, there aren't other opportunities for you to do just that, either in that same meeting or in a different meeting. So I, there was a case of, I'm working with a district here in Rhode Island that had a, has a hot button issue going on. And we wrestled with this. The, the chair said, I know there are going to be lots of public comment about this, but I don't want to be in the position where we're just reacting to public comment. So we strategized and said, well, why don't you just say what you need to say up front? Have an introductory statement from the chair. And, and the superintendent said a few things about this topic. And then they let the public have their say. And it was the public, in that sense, sort of got the last word. The chair and the superintendent didn't come back and say, well, Sally said this, but she's wrong about that. They just let it ride. But yet the district had a chance to at least put its cards on the table up front. I'm sure there was stuff they wanted to say after public comment, but they held their tongue. Okay, so let's talk about beyond the school committee meeting. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys touched on most of these, but certainly while we think about school committee meetings as the primary and most visible venue for getting all this input and feedback from the public, there are lots of others, and I think you guys hit on them all, uh, except maybe news and media coverage. That, too, is voices from your community, whether it's the reporter themselves, the editor, or the people they interview. That's another way of sort of hearing what we, what we What's going on in the community, sometimes not always in ways that we agree with. Um, the more dramatic ways, of course, are also petitions and protests and walkouts. We're seeing more and more of those, including student walkouts over certain issues. That is the community talking to you <laughs> and to others, and how do we listen to those things? I think what strikes me, and, and Cynic sort of hit on this in his piece too, is that our, our natural reaction, especially if we have a firm position on something, is to defend. And to sort of say, if someone's pushing back on me, my first reaction is to figure out how I can prove how wrong they are. And try to put holes in their argument, stand my ground, uh, and come out victorious, um, and make sure that no one's paying attention to any of this other stuff that's pushed back. And it's human nature. I think what is hard for us in this sector in particular, and maybe just as human beings, is to actually sort of say, what if I'm not so firm on my ground? And what if this feedback I'm getting whether it's coming in a hostile format or a polite format in writing at a school committee meeting, what if there's something in there that I need to listen to because there's value in it? Even if the means are terrible, 
is there something in the message that I need to pay attention to? I'm so impressed when I meet certain school community members who can do this really well, who can come in with an idea about an issue, but truly be open to seeing where the public is on this. Not because they want to go with the majority, but because they know there are different points of view out there that maybe they haven't entertained. That's a really important skill for us to have. And I think especially in this polarized culture in which we live, it's very easy for someone just to say, I'm in this camp, they're in that camp, which of us is going to win? Instead of sort of saying, is there something we can learn from one another? Let's talk about social media. Everyone take a deep breath. I know it's the bane of most people's existence. Um, it is certainly a place where we hear from the community, shall we say. Um, I hear all the time from superintendents and school committees who are frustrated that not only are they being torn to shreds in social media, but it's often happening in groups to which they do not even have access. Everyone's <laughs> familiar with that dynamic, right? The friends of so-and-so is the name of the group. You're like, if those are my friends, <laughs> we've got problems. <laughs> so let's talk about social media and what it means and doesn't mean. What I often hear from, from my clients that I work with, I get a call first thing in the morning, Chris, this issue is blowing up on social media. OK, all right, let's talk about what that means. Define blowing up. Ah, there are like 10 people who are losing their minds. <laughs> and they are going back and forth and saying all kinds of lies. And this group has hundreds of followers, if not thousands. They're all getting this misinformation. Now, I'm not belittling the, the pain of that or the seriousness of that. But I always try to put it in context and say, OK, if it is literally 10 people, even if it's 20 people, let's say 30, be really generous. You have thousands and thousands of constituents. And I believe there's a way to use social media to find out whether that is simply the rantings and ravings of 10 or 12 or 30 fringe people, or is there something more to it? And maybe based on who's commenting and who's agreeing, who's pushing back, you may get a sense about how legit this argument or claim really is. You may talk to your principals who know these folks even better. And they may be able to say, oh, you know what? This parent is putting this up as actually a reasonable person. Maybe there's something to this. Use it as a barometer, not the end all be all. OK? Um, I think it's really important to keep it in context. One of the things that strikes me that I'm believing more and more in this work is that we don't often give our constituents enough credit. We think about these 10, 20, 30, Folks who are very passionate online and spend way too much time on Facebook and Twitter and God knows where else. Um, and we tend to think that that is indicative of the community. And I'm not writing those folks off, because they are your constituents too. But I tend to think that there are more reasonable people out there who don't read everything they, they don't believe everything they read. And I think that we are all becoming more and more skeptical about social media in general, that we take this stuff with a grain of salt. And I want you to sort of give your, your parents in particular a little more credit for being able to be a little discerning, both about their neighbors who are ranting and raving online, but also about the facts. And the fact that someone posts, the blank school committee is trying to destroy our kids. They don't go, oh my goodness, I did not know that. Thank you for that news. I like this comment. Um, give them some credit. If anything, I think we all approach this work so much more with a healthy dose of skepticism that we say, Huh, I wonder what that person's agenda is. I certainly do that in my line of work, but I really believe that people are more likely to do that. So I'm not dismissing the power of social media or the threat it presents, especially when something spirals, but I'm more suggesting that if something truly spirals, it may be because it has legs, that there may be some truth to what is being told. Maybe not, but not to sort of freak out the minute you see something getting a lot of activity online. A very clear piece of advice I want to give you and I know not everyone agrees with me on this, is do not engage on social media. I know it's tempting. And you want to say, well, all I'm going to do is set the record straight on this one point, and then I'm going to walk away. <laughs> wow, congratulations. It's never been done. <laughs> so whether individually, you know, it's easy to say, I'm taking off my school committee mat, my hat. I'm just going to be a resident, and I'm going to comment on this. I'm like, oh, really? Let's just not. Because one, it's a slippery slope, right? Two, uh, it starts to raise some questions about 
open meeting law and sunshine law, especially if more than one school committee member starts to chime in. You have forums that have been used to have discussions with their community. Let them have this. Monitor it, be mindful of it, but don't jump into the fray because you'll never get out and you're never going to win. I've never heard anyone say, well, geez, I thought one thing, but then someone posted a comment on Facebook and it just changed my mind. I saw the light. Doesn't happen. So I'm also a big believer that school districts should have their own social media accounts. This was a battle I fought, I'm going to date myself now, back in 2004 at the birth of Facebook when we were reinventing communications for the Boston Public Schools. And I said, we've got to be in this space telling our story. And people were terrified. Facebook was new. I think they'd be terrified today anyway, but districts are doing it more and more. Not because I wanted to create another space for people to come and scream at us, because that was everyone's fear. Why put out a welcome app for people to tell us how much we stink? Those venues already exist. The question is, they can exist without us, or we can be in there telling our own story, pushing out good news, sharing our side of policy proposals, being clear about what we're working on. And if people want to go in the comments section and be ugly about it, as painful as it is, we said, let them do it. We're not going to chime in. We will moderate for certain ground rules like profanity, personal attacks, that kind of thing. But we are not going to have back and forth. It's not a place to ask questions. We're going to let it just run its course. And what we found, for the most part, was that parents, again, not giving them enough credit, parents themselves are often the one to say, you know what, Carl, you're out of line. Your comment's not true. That's not the experience I had with my child in my school. We're really happy with this school, whatever it may be. Let them have that back and forth. You don't need to come in and, and moderate that. All right, I'm going to take my chances and throw open the floor on social media. I know more and more people doing it. Certainly with this new Twitter news, people are saying, I'm off Twitter. Um, a part of me would love to leave social media because I think you're right. I think it is unhealthy. And I think we're learning more and more about just how unhealthy it is for our kids in particular. I mean, these social emotional issues are only exacerbated by social media. Um, but again, the reality is it's out there. The conversation is happening. And individually, we may want to close our eyes. I stay on it because of what I do for a living. And I can't say, oh, there's a drama happening in town X, but I don't have Facebook. I've got to go in there. Other reactions? Yeah. So one of the, I, I think that's one of them. Uh, one of the problems that I see is that the lack of local media coverage of school um, really has impacted our ability to tell our story. Yeah. So as little as I like the Facebook uh, a lot around it or any other social media platform, we have to find a way to tell our story. Um, and I, one of the things we heard in a, and I think it was that same message uh, session. Um, they would care about we, we just don't, we don't have that. And, and our superintendents often don't have the skills themselves. So we need help to do this well. Yeah. Whether it's on Facebook or any other method of communication I just think the communication piece, even though it's one way, no. it's, it's how we tell a story, absent other people. Absolutely. That is the cornerstone of what I do. I absolutely love that question about how do we tell our story. So aside from everything we're talking about today in terms of the listening, there is also the school committee, uh, the school district's job in doing the telling. Uh, I've got three, my sister's three kids are in Lincoln. And I think that your district does a nice job. Like, I follow them on Twitter. And every now and then, I'll see something about one of my nieces that my sister didn't tell me. I'm like, how come I had to read about this on Twitter? Um, but the point is, we live in a very different environment now than we did 10, 15, 20 years ago, even, where people relied on, when I was in high school, my parents got their news from the newspaper that literally arrived on their doorstep in the morning and the 6 o'clock news at night. And that's not uncommon, right? Today, that, it seems like, a dinosaur. Those vehicles still exist, and I think we still have to rely on them because people get their news from them still. But there are so many more venues for news getting out there, including social media, that we have to take advantage of them. So when I work with districts to tell their story, it's find that good story, make sure you are telling it on Twitter and Facebook, but you're also emailing it to parents. You are finding other more analog ways of getting it into people's homes. There was a long time when media were the only game in town, so we couldn't rebut anything. I see this as an opportunity that we have now all these different channels, most of which are technology, but not all, 
to be able to counter that narrative with our own narrative. So I think you're absolutely right. Somebody had a hand up over here, then I'll come over here. I think what you're talking about is mindset. Um, when I was elected to school committee, I saw the void in what I refer to as marketing. And it's a joke um, now. And, and one of the members of our school committee will say, oh, get Mary out with her sign board, her sandwich board, because this is a marketing moment. And I, it's a shift that has to take place in the minds of the administration and the school committee, and where when something happens, your default thought is, let's get this out. And I think oftentimes what happens if you don't have that mindset is it's way after the fact. Oh, we should have, we should have, you know? And so I think it's mindset, and you have to shift that. Such a great point. Thank you. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's partially mindset. It's also capacity, because I think so many of your districts say, we know we need to do a better job telling our story. I can't hire one communications person, let alone a team, um, because that's what it takes. And it works out well for me, because I get more work, because nobody has this capacity in their districts. But if I'm being honest, I think you all need that. There's no other organization in the world, certainly not in the for-profit sector, of your size with your budget that wouldn't have at least one, if not two people, and a budget to do your public relations, your marketing, your social media, your press relations, all the stuff that organizations just do, including nonprofits, by the way. Even a nonprofit, a third of your size, would have a communications person because they've got to be telling their story to raise the money and have the impact they want to have. Um, I use uh, social media only to post agendas and links to supporting documents. That's it. Um, but there has been one occasion in the last year where I felt like it was important that I made a personal statement to provide context in something that had occurred within our school committee. So what I did was I used my campaign website and I posted my statement on my website and a link to my statement on social media and I disabled the comments on social media. But I allowed them on my website. So literally, Facebook and Twitter, I had, here is my comment on everything everyone's reading in the paper. No one was able to comment, but it was a direct link to my website where people could comment, which meant, meant there was no back and forth, but people still felt like they had access to what I was trying to say, and it was very useful for me. Good. Thank you. I just want to caution you, too, in this, not necessarily if it's a campaign statement, but if it's a statement in your capacity as school committee members, that can never be on social media alone because it requires a login and a password. Sunshine laws would dictate that any statement that you, any official business that the school committee conducts would have to be accessible to people not on social media, therefore on your website as, as, a, as a baseline. Yes? Whether we like it or not, uh, social media is neutral. How you use it determines whether it's good or bad. Yeah. So, and, and I think in today's environment, it's, whether we like it or not, we're competing with charter schools. We're competing with everybody. So to your, to your point about mindset and a marketing moment, I don't like the words marketing with schools, but it's true. It is true. We have to be able to tell our story, and social media is an inexpensive and quick way to tell the story, but we have to control, and like you said, I mean, how many districts are going to be able to put a line item for a communications director in their budget? It's just not going to work. So capacity is the issue. How do you do it internally? But it's a necessary evil, um, and, and I don't see a way around it because there's no, you have to, there are so many, I think every district has good things happening. Yeah. The only people who know are the people who are in that little club, right? If I'm in that school or if I'm in that particular thing that's good, I know about it, but your community at large needs to know about it because we have to change their mindsets too. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I want to be clear too that I, I believe it's important to use these channels to be honest with the community about a lot of things. I always sort of just push back a little, people say we need to use all these channels to tell the good news. I say, you need to use those channels to tell the news. And we struggled with that in Boston a little bit, because there was this attitude of like, everyone already knows all the bad stuff that's going on. Let's just go tell all the good stuff. But you immediately lose credibility when you do that, because you're just then, then you're truly public relations and spin. So part of our job was, how do we use these channels to also to talk about what's not working so well, but to make clear to the community that we are working on them. Our fourth grade literacy scores are not where they need to be. Here are the six things that we're going to do to fix that. That's a good use of those channels, too. Yes. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that um, 
it's great to have, I'm from Coventry, we have our own Coventry Schools website in social media, Facebook or whatever. The interesting thing is we don't get a lot of hits. <laughs> and so if you watch the traffic and then you look at another um, Facebook site like um, Parents of Coventry, or Coventry is the biggest, you know, landmass, but the smallest state, you know, part of the state or whatever, whatever. There's a bunch of them. Um, they have so much more traffic. So it's always, a, a, it's it, because there's more controversy on those ones mm -hmm. than on ours. So that's my one statement on that, and I'm not sure how you increase that. Um, the other thing, to get back to a former um, discussion on, um, I've been chair for 12 years, so I personally do not go on and look at all the horrible comments, mainly because I really want to be objective, and I don't want mm. someone to come to my meeting that I recognize that said something horrible and then have to be fighting my emotions. Um, so my school committee members who spend more time watching will tell me information, and I just say, you know, I, I, th that's fine. You know, if there's something really intense that you need to tell me, fine, but I'm not watching it. When I have a new school com committee member come on board, they basically say, okay, so what's the deal? Can I go on social media? And I give them the, you know, the whatevers. And I basically say, um, my advice is to stay off. Don't, do not engage with the public, because no matter how objective you are and how much you are telling what you perceive as the truth, when you start re looking at what people are saying back to you, you're gonna be so discouraged mm -hmm that you're gonna to wanna to defend yourself or defend the school. And even if I've had folks go on and say, this is just my opinion as a school committee member, it's not the whole committee, I'm only one person, um, but still the attacks occur. And so all of those people that I've seen sort of mature on school committee have said, I quit it, I quit it. <laughs> um, so they don't go on anymore. Yeah, very fair. Uh, a couple reactions to that. One, I feel the same way about the comments on online news stories, meaning like if you go to the blank times and they've got a story about your schools, I, I just never read the comments or unless I'm really just feeling like I need to punish myself for some reason. <laughs> um, and I encourage people not to take too much stock in that either because again, it's, it's the, my friend calls them the bloodthirsty shut-ins who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who go on those comment sections. It's not, it's not rational back and forth. To your first question about or comment about um, Followers. I mean, I think it's like any other social media account. If the content is good and consistent and people are excited about it, the followers will come. I think there are strategies like putting your you know, social media icons in your signature line and emails, that kind of thing. But I think ultimately it's people sharing. And what gets that attention more than anything in our sector is kids they know, staff they know who are being celebrated, and someone shares it because it's their next door neighbor and it's wonderful. And then suddenly someone else wants to follow the Coventry Public Schools. It's, it's, it's that ripple effect. Somebody else had a hand here? Emily? Copeland, Portsmouth. We found the same thing that our district website, people go there when there's a problem. But this is where I think if you really look at your individual schools, parents will look for their kids at the schools. And I have to commend our principals. They really, particularly at the younger grades, have done a lot of pushing out. Facebook comment, and here we had Arbor Day celebrations, and everybody looks at their own kids. So I would say, maybe not worry about the district as much, but really look at things at the school level. In terms of social media, I, I've been burned once, but I, I tend to engage a little bit more. Um, but I do think sometimes there's a useful thing that can nip some things in the bud, at least in our community where things tend to spiral. So one example was, prom last year. Oh, the principal's not going to have prom. The kids aren't going to have prom. There's not going to be anything. And so all I did was sort of say, the high school principal will discuss prom at the school committee meeting. And that I just, I mean, I think if we just use it to push out where information can be found or where information can be discussed. But for example, we had a bond um, initiative in Portsmouth and you helped us with that quite a bit. And we had one person in the community not affiliated with the school committee, but in support of the bond, and her job was to really counter a lot of that misinformation. So they'd come out and say, I can't believe they're spending seven million on the bathrooms. And she'd say, well, here's what they're really doing on the bathrooms. And then we'd have the official school committee stuff. So I do think there are times when you do have to engage, but you have to be very strategic how you choose to engage. But yeah, I admire your courage. Um, 
I don't think it's that courage. No, 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 it is definitely courage because as Booker T. Honorable, you, I think you lucked out to be able to make that statement and walk away. Because for one thing, even if people don't want to react to that statement, they'd say, oh, Emily's out there. Maybe if I just comment enough, be provocative enough, she's going to chime back in. You may not. I just feel like it's there is that slippery slope where once you, you can't sort of unring that bell if you're, once you're in that space. Um, but I think your, your illustration about the bond is a really good one that goes back to your point as well. But to me, the most valuable thing about social media is it's just data. And just like any data set, we've got to sort of check it and make sure it's valid or whatever. But if enough people are talking about $7 million worth of bathrooms, then maybe social media isn't the venue to push back on that. But next time you do a presentation, about the bond referendum, you have to know that we're going to lead with, maybe not lead with that term, but make a point of saying what we're really spending and what it's going to go for and all of that. So just using that data to inform your other communication practices as opposed to saying, ah, let's fight this out with social media. Somebody else had a hand up over here. Yeah. OK, we can come back to social media. Was that a like? Yeah. <laughs> what do you do about what gets said at other elected uh, bodies meetings that are uh, sort of disparaging of the school committee or of the school district. Uh, I was, was going to guess your town based on that question, but I was wrong. Um, <laughs> good, it's a good question. I think a lot of the same strategies, I mean, I think there's, there are also more formal steps you can take when you are legitimately two bodies in town and perhaps, you know, a letter from one to the other um, appearing at that other meeting to say, I'm here to set the record straight. Um, but again, I think all these other things too. I mean, I worked with a, another Rhode Island district that had something similar recently. And we just had a whole strategy of, we're not going to go after that body per se. We did a little bit. But it was more like, well, we have to have our narrative about what that body claims to set the record straight about what they're saying, which is somewhat true, somewhat untrue. Let's acknowledge what was true and also set the record straight on that, which was not. Um, but I think, I think that does require a little bit more to be a little bit more forthright and acknowledging that. It's not just like some random person on Pearl Street saying this, but it's in other elected officials. I think you're within your bounds to say, we're making a formal statement about this. Okay. Let's move on, as I said, we can go back to it. This sort of picks up on that point, but I want you all to just take a moment and reflect on this question. And I've been trying to do this in my own line of work too, as, as these issues have become more and more heated. And that is this, do I pick and choose when and to whom I listen? Sort of goes with what I was saying earlier about the two camps. I think it's very tempting to sort of just find yourself in camp A, and you're not going to hear a word from camp B, because those are the crazies. And we're right. And we've got the kids on our side. We're doing God's work. Those are the people who are the problem. I'm not going to listen to them. And I get it. Sometimes that can play out so authentically that, that you start to just shut down and not hear what other people have to say. But I think there is also something to be said for setting aside the messenger again, and even the means, again, as I said earlier, trying to find some kernels of truth, even amid all the noise. The first superintendent I worked for when I was working for the school committee uh, was Tom Paisan in, in Boston. He was just an incredible man. Fortunately, he died a couple of years ago. But I learned so much from him, not just about education, but about what it means to be a leader in that seat. Um, Tom was unflappable. And even in those meetings where people are literally like coming in screaming with signs and chants and the most hateful, combative public comment you can imagine, he was cool, calm, and collected. And I think in 12 years of knowing him, I rarely ever saw him lose his cool. One day he got ticked off and I think said, heck. And we were all like, oh my god, he said heck. Um, but he's just that kind of person who was so measured and even that even in public comment, people could be insulting him to his face and he would just sort of just be still looking at them, and even nodding at times, always taking copious notes. And there, let's face it, there are some people who we know, and I want you to reflect on this one or two person in your district, I'm sure they'll come to mind pretty quickly, who we call our frequent flyers, who are at every school committee meeting, and they are there not to tell you what a great job you're doing. <laughs> you could have a resolution saying the sky is blue and they're going to speak against it, because it's not just blue. Um, you know your frequent flyers. And I think like any, again, human nature, we had some folks like that who would come to every meeting and it was always just to tell us how bad the schools were, how much the school committee should resign, how incompetent the superintendent was. So the most of us just shut them out. They have nothing constructive to add. And Tom, to his credit, would just listen to them time after time just to see if there was any kernel of truth. 
And we'd be debriefing a meeting, and he would say, well, you know, I'll make up a name here. You know, Alice brought up a good point. And we're like, Alice brought up a good point <laughs> when she was screaming at you? But he was that good at just sort of sorting out the noise. And he would you know, look at testimony and almost not pay attention to whose name was at the top of it. If there was some kernel of truth in there that would resonate with him, he would take it seriously. That's the art of listening, as I, as I think about it. And being able really to set aside your biases and all those emotions and try to find the truth. The other thing this brings up for me, and this was painfully true in COVID, is to try to figure out where people are coming from and what are the emotions that are underlying their vitriol. What we saw during COVID, at least what I saw, when districts were wrestling with, this was probably less true here in Rhode Island, but certainly in Massachusetts, wrestling with, do we go full remote, hybrid or full in person, as you know, there were just people in every one of those camps. And often the school committee and the superintendent were not necessarily on the same page, but they would come out with a proposal and people would come out kicking and screaming about why every kid should be in school every day or why every kid should be home every day. And regardless of what they were screaming about, we had to remind ourselves that every single one of those parents was operating from a place of fear. And fear is a powerful emotion. No one was up there screaming and shouting because they didn't care about their kid. The kids, people who wanted their kids in school thought that was best for their child, to be around their peers and in front of their teachers. And they were willing to take some risks with the virus, knowing that you had all done a great job mitigating some of that, in order to get that. Parents in the other camp were just as worried about their kids. They said, please let them stay home. Maybe they're worried about their kids or their elderly parent someone immunocompromised, whatever. But I had to remind myself and my clients not to be so dug in, in that you're saying, oh, that person's coming to school community to tell us that we can't go full in person. Well, let's tell them a thing or two. It's like, no, let's just understand where they are. And maybe we don't have to agree with them. and We have to do a better job making the case for our position, but at least acknowledge that they're coming from a place of authentic fear. And I think that's true for so much of these battles that we're engaged in is we're looking just at the surface and not at what's underlying them and trying to figure out sort of what's the humanity behind it. Sometimes it may help us take a different approach, sometimes maybe not, but it's worth always reminding ourselves about that. The other point I wanted to make on this slide is that it sort of goes back to the, the same point, but that it's too easy just to sort of surround ourselves with people who think the way we do and who have the same opinion about a policy or politics or anything else, and it just becomes an echo chamber. I think that happens on Facebook too, at least within, you know, not the groups, but my friendships. Most people I'm friends with on Facebook see the world the way I do, for the most part. Because um, if they're really nut jobs, I probably have unfriended them anyway. Um, but it can become an echo chamber, where you're so validating one another that you don't even start to see legitimacy of any other points of view. Now, obviously, there are extremes to this. I'm not try trying to say that anyone who is blatantly racist or anti-trans kids or whatever that may be that is so against the core of who we are as humans that we cut them some slack and say, well, let's see what they have to say. It's more about just sort of having some context to say, I've got to hear them out. And I've got to let them know that I heard them before I come and tell them why we are doing what we are doing on the right side of things. Amy. Um, so I really got hit with this uh, this summer. I was doxxed. Um, people went after my husband. Um, I was um, put on a blogger's website, Turtle Boy, out mm. of Massachusetts, with my name, um, my town, photos from my Facebook page. Um, I... <laughs> I went through a lot, um, and honestly, I came out of it really hating people. <laughs> I got to be honest, this like taking this job and doing this. And so, my gut reaction when I see this is that no, I don't have to listen to everyone because some people have not earned the right for me to listen to them. And I understand what you're talking about when you say that there is a kernel of truth, and yes, perhaps there's a kernel of truth, but when you are being attacked, 
when you're being personally attacked, when your business, which is entirely separate, when people are commenting on your business social media, contacting your clients, like it, it was very bad. It wasn't even a vote, by the way. This was just a discussion <laughs> that, that this came, this happened to me. Um, when a parent stands up at public comment and says, if kids die, they die. I do not choose to listen to that and to see that point of view. And that might be wrong, but I think, and I understand what you're saying, but I think there are some lines that get crossed and that have gotten crossed. And I don't know how to come back from that. And I'm sure I'm not the only person in here that is going through that. But do I pick and choose when I, and to whom I listen? Yes, I do. And it's not always right, and I fully admit that I will stare people in the face, and I will watch, and I will be nodding at public comment, and I'm making the eye contact, especially when they are directly talking to me, and during the toughest moments, and in my head, I'm like, I need groceries. What groceries am I going to be getting? And, and I'm I nodding. Wine. Yes, I need wine. I need liquor. Um, <laughs> but I just, yeah. And I know that I, I'm sure I'm not the only person. I don't know that other people have necessarily been to that extreme or went to that extreme, but how do we, in such divisive times, because right now I really say, mm, yeah, I, I get to pick and choose, and I don't always listen, so how do we move on from that? Very fair. First of all, I'm so sorry. Um, that, is, that is brutal, and it's exactly those kind of stories that are the reason we see so many school committee members and other elected officials around the country saying, the hell with this. I know it's a really big paycheck, and that's tempting. But uh, <laughs> I mean, to, to be a public servant and to do this because you care about your community and the schools, and then to go through that is unconscionable. Um, and it's horrific. And, and sadly, you know, I think some of these examples are, are actually violations of the law, too, where you know, you'd be within your rights to say, this is stalking or harassment or whatever. Um, but even if it falls short of that, it all gets very personalized. So I want to be clear, your points are so well taken. Um, none of this is about me saying, well, I want you to validate their point of view or legitimize it, because that's not it. It's the unfortunate reality that as elected officials, every one of your constituents is your constituent. And you do not have to agree with them. You do not have to act on anything they say. But unfortunately, we do have a responsibility to listen to them. And it sounds like you did just that. Uh, you didn't put on your headphones and say, I'm not hearing what you have to say. You heard it. You were disgusted by it. And you went a different route in your policy choices. That is absolutely what I'm suggesting. But just being clear that we, no matter how much we want to sort of say, that's not my constituent, they are. And that one happens to be a lunatic. I'm so sorry. Any other reflections? Yes. Uh, yeah, we will. We'll ask our wishes. Um, but I definitely do that guilty as charged and the, the frequent flyers come up and I when you said something about groceries that is exactly what I start doing I got to get the okay I got to make the vet appointment I got to do that's what I do I detach and I know it's wrong but yeah. it's it's a mechanism to help me deal yeah. and that's all it is but if I, I mean I know I need to learn how to deal with it differently um, but, but it, it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, that makes total, it's a total coping mechanism, and I agree with it. And I think this is probably, I think what I'm talking about is less when people are truly off their rocker and just spouting nonsense that is not even grounded, as opposed to people with differing viewpoints on a policy issue. Anne? Hi, thanks. Anne Musella, East Greenwich. Um, I'm so sorry about what happened. And, you know, so many of us are experiencing that, but to a lesser degree. Just on this topic of listening and wrapping this all up with, we've heard, you know, talking about camps A and B, right? Um, we've heard a lot through COVID, open our schools, unmask our kids, all of that. Um, from Camp B, let's call it, you haven't heard us. You don't give us the opportunity to be heard. And so I, I try very hard to make sure there's a public showing of the opportunity to be heard because what's actually happening is you are being heard at school committee meetings, on your own website, on all of your social media accounts, including the secret ones, um, you know, you are being heard, you're just not getting the answer you want. That's right. 
and and that's tricky and we have to we're trying to we try to be very strategic about as you said in the public comment stuff about putting that in those pieces of information in the public stream so that anybody who's somewhere in between camps A and B, you know, the people we sit on the bleachers with at our kids' games, you know, <laughs> who don't want to pick a side, you know, because we're a small town, um, have the opportunity to say, well, no, it's all out there, and then we can just amplify it. But it's very difficult. Thanks. Yeah, that is so true. Um, thank you, Anne. And I think, you know, yeah, I'm not going to add anything because I think you said it well. Um, but I am going to move on. Um, so on that note, oh, I was just, I'm going to agree that I think that's people's sort of last resort. It's always easy to say they're not listening if they don't get the answer they want. I think that's brilliant. So other opportunities to listen and engage. We've established, and you knew already, that school committee meetings are not opportunities certainly to engage. It's much more about I'm here to tell you stuff, you're here to tell me stuff, meeting adjourned. So what are these other mechanisms we can put in place to really engage in some dialogue? And here I want you to think less about sort of those fringe folks who are behaving horrifically and more about sort of the, the, the reasonable middle who may have true dilemmas about some of these issues and are trying to sort it out. What are some of the ways we can listen to them differently and also engage with them? The first is the one that the colleague from this table mentioned sort of at the start, community forums. I'm such a big believer in this especially because school committee meetings are so limited, it's a way to say to the public, we're gonna create a forum that's different, where we're truly gonna engage in some conversation. We had a school committee member in Boston who was very passionate about this. She just hated school committee meetings because she wanted so much more give and take with the audience, and it just wasn't the right venue for it. So she came up with her own strategy and got the blessing of the chair and her colleagues to have a series of community forums. I think she did something like four or five in one school year. And she announced the series at the beginning of the year and the topics. So every other month she was going to do one on, let's say, arts and music, another on SEL, another on bilingual ed. I'm making these up. But it was that kind of thing where there was sort of a broad topic. But it wasn't about a particular policy decision. It wasn't come and tell us whether we think you should vote yes or no on this. But just let's have a community conversation about these topics generally. And she worked with an outside group to sort of help structure those conversations to facilitate those conversations, um, and to figure out what to do with the, with the takeaways. So she set it up very much like this, where the, it wasn't the school committee the superintendent at the front of the room lecturing and getting reactions from the community. They were out there, and every table had a school committee member, a principal, a parent, a teacher, a student, and maybe there was some presentation up front, again, not from the school committee, but from some third party, maybe a community member, about just sort of setting the stage. It was conversation. And it worked really well. And it sounds like, I forget, it was Barrington that does this? Yeah. Do you find that you get a different reaction to the outcomes of those? I know you weren't the one who brought it up, but I'm putting you on the spot because your colleague's not here. Yeah, so uh, we do, uh, there are more community workshops. There are presentations given by administrators within the district or staff members. Um, but we do find, uh, because it is a conversation, um, an opportunity for engagement, especially among families and um, parents in the community to engage with our administrators, um, we do get different feedback. Um, people are often, the feedback we get from members of the community is that they find it um, incredibly informative, even more so informative than our business meetings, um, because they can go in depth um, at the school that they're interested, where their child attends, um, to hear about what's happening and ask questions. That's great, thank you. I, I, I really do think the key is that it's about a topic that isn't up for decision right now. You know, we did one with Fall River recently, not recently, it's been a few years now, about college readiness. The superintendent of the school committee said, there's just a lot of different opinions in this town about what college readiness even means, and does it matter? There was no decision to be made. It wasn't about changing the graduation policy or anything on the table, so people weren't coming loaded for bear with what they wanted to get out of it. It was just, let's come and talk about what it means to be college ready. And is that right for every kid? And what does it look like for the high school? And all these kind of questions. It was a great event. And they didn't do five of them. They just did that one. But even that sent a signal that they were trying to engage the community differently. OK. Another one, focus groups, just another way of sort of hearing from the community. I think it's rarely used. But again, it's not about come one, come all, but really just getting together sort of smaller groups of people, perhaps representing the, the range of PK to 12, or different educational programs, different schools, whatever, whatever question you're trying to wrestle with. There are people you can hire to do focus groups to have those more in-depth conversations 
And in those, I would recommend there's no one from the administration in the room. It's just the facilitator and the members of the public, and they are gathering data for you. Gathering data, that's the refrain to keep coming back to. Speaking of data, someone mentioned this earlier. Surveys, polls, questionnaires. We saw a lot of these during COVID, at least I did. Um, about what do you think? Should we, be, should we be masked or not? Should we be hybrid? Should we be uh, full in person, so on? And I think what happens sometimes is people start to think it's a ballot. Like, let's make sure everyone t participates in this survey. <laughs> I'm looking at Kate, she's nodding at me. Um, to make sure that uh, we get some data. And there's always this fear that people are going to take the survey 35 times. Um, so being really clear about the words you choose. Um, I've worked in a district where we resisted the word survey and poll for that very reason. We said, let's call it a questionnaire. We're just getting the pulse of the community here. And it's not as if the majority is going to win based on this questionnaire. So these are tricky. And you've got to be really careful because I think sometimes if we use even the word survey or poll, people expect something more scientific than most of us can afford to put out. I don't think you can afford to hire Gallup to find out the questions you want to know in your town. But I do think it's a valuable tool when used well. Listening sessions, coffee hours, love these. Again, maybe it's one person, maybe it's two people. This is a good way for school committee members to pair up without being a quorum, uh, going off with the superintendent, having coffee hours in different schools, different times of day. Some parents are free in the morning, some are free in the evening. Just, again, literally to come and listen. You're not there to problem solve. People might bring some problems to you that you can go back and solve, but it's really a chance to be sort of more intimate with folks and not in a setting like this where everyone feels like they've got to come up and speak from the mic. Regardless of which tools you use or which mechanisms, when you hear back from the community, make sure you report back what you've heard. I think we do this somewhat well with polls and questionnaires and surveys, but with other means too. Anytime you are out there listening, make sure you report back what you heard. That was one of the beautiful pieces about the community forum structure that I mentioned is that, as I said, Susan took all those notes and worked with the team to synthesize them and come back and was reporting to the school committee, but more importantly to the community, about the themes that emerged, the questions that emerged, some ideas that emerged. And an important point with this, I think, is too, is not just sort of reporting back what most people want, but making sure everyone feels heard again. To be able to say, yes, we heard from a lot of parents who think we should do X, but we also heard from some parents who feel that because of Y and Z, we should consider this other route. And I think anytime you're writing to the community, maybe this is more of a superintendent thing, but I always encourage them to sort of acknowledge the camps, even without calling them camps. But um, the art of listening also applies to our colleagues. Again, this came up in the previous session so well, and I wish I'd heard more of it. But how, do we, how are we at listening to the people in our own school committee or our superintendent or others that we work with? How good are we at listening to them? Or is, are they a frequent flyer in our mind of like, oh, God, Jerry's about to speak. I know what this is going to be. Um, and after a while, when Jerry starts to say the same thing over and over again, I get that tendency. But do we at least find a way to make sure that Jerry knows that we have heard him, we just happen to disagree, or do we ice him out? And vice versa. How does Jerry feel when none of us agree with him? Third, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to model good listening skills for our students. I always try to end by talking about students because I think it's obviously what it's all about. And the last presenter has mentioned this too. It breaks my heart. Um, that what's going on, that the kids are watching all of this. Not just school committee meetings, but the world. And seeing adults behave this way, like I just got a little emotional because it's just we are not modeling what we want our kids to be or think or feel or do. Um, and it's, it's sad and it's having an impact. I think we have all these theories about why kids are so dysregulated and so on. And very few people are saying maybe because the adults are acting like idiots <laughs> and screaming at one another. Um, and doing, behaving in ways that we would never allow them to behave in school, or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, so it's a, it's a really important point. And then finally, just leave you with this proverb that really resonates for me. Listening is the most difficult skill to learn and the most important to have. So this is a work in progress. We can all get better at listening. I certainly can. Uh, professionally, personally, it's a very, very hard skill. But like anything else, it takes practice and I think a real consciousness about how well we do or don't listen to whom <laughs> and when. Uh, so I really appreciate the chance to, to share some of those thoughts with you today and, and to really touch on this important topic. Um, speaking of social media, those of you who are on Twitter, welcome to follow me. Um, we have a few minutes for final questions, comments, anything we didn't touch on today that you're 
burning to talk about? Yes, let me get you the mic. Uh, quick what do you think of online petitions? Oh, what do I think of online petitions? Um, they serve a purpose. I mean, I think one good thing is, unlike those surveys I mentioned, people have to put a name, presumably. So as long as people are signing their name, it actually gives you an idea of how many people, at least on paper, feel a certain way about a certain thing. Um, then again, I think some of those people, it can just be a knee-jerk thing of how the question is even posed. And people may not even agree with, or fully understand what they're signing on to. Um, I guess I would consider it another data point, but like any data point, taking it, maybe not with a grain of salt, but with a little bit of trepidation about its validity. Do you, uh, what are your thoughts about online petitions? I can apply and dismiss them. They're going to mislead me as much as they're likely to give me important information. We had one in 10% who were from out of the district to begin with. Say that again louder. So, so we had one presented to us. 10% of the people who signed it were from outside the district ah. and they self-identified that way. So God only knows what the people who said they were from <laughs> yeah. the district really, if they really were. We've had people actually come to our meetings and, and give an address in our district, Ooh. but then you find out they actually live somewhere else yep. through Google or whatever. So I'm, I, I think they're going to mislead us. If, you know, if you take any of the information from it, you're probably going to make the wrong decision if you base it on any of that. Yeah, I mean, to me, I mean, it's, it's, some towns are obviously smaller than others. And, but to me, like, one of the advantages of school committees is that you are members of the community. And I think some of the most valuable data you can get is almost intuitive by being out and about in the community. And as painful as it is when you're just trying to go grab a carton of eggs that someone stops and talks to you, but to see that as an opportunity to learn a little bit more. And, and I can always tell when I talk to school community members about who really is engaged in other things and, and, and talks to other people and who are sort of like a little bit withdrawn because they almost don't want to deal with that, which I, again, would only totally understand in some ways. But I think by being out and about and talking to people from different walks of life and from different neighborhoods and different schools or whatever, I believe that you all can get a better sense of where people's heads and hearts are that way than through any petition. I also just never sign those petitions because I also feel like I don't believe that they ever really move the needle that much. So even as and someone who considers myself an activist, I'm just like, oh, really, a petition? I think we can do better than that. But <laughs> that's just me, though. Other questions, comments? Yes. I'm going to give you the mic just so it gets recorded. Thank you. I'm Tim Yunus from East Greenwich. Hi. Um, this might sound a little contrarian or not everybody's problem, but um, uh, my experience in my year and a half on the school committee is it, there was, you know, it was wild and woolly with masks, and then after that it's gone very quiet. Um, and I always ask myself, I find the level of community engagement in the schools depressingly low. I find, you know, the number of people who want to seriously come and talk about curriculum or where the school is spending its money and its priorities, who want to engage in the strategic planning process, very, very low. I'll give you a specific example. I mean, we're in a, you know, in the midst of a major building program, which could, you know, cost upwards of over a hundred million dollars. Um, and we had, you know, we have, I think, excellent architectural project management resources and stuff like that. And we schedule a whole number of community sessions at each school. So six schools are scheduling these sessions to weigh in on new buildings and what you want to see and the future of education. To me, that's exciting. We got three people to one of these meetings. We had, and this is East Greenwich, and everybody professes it's a great school system. You know, we're really engaged. Uh, the level of engagement is is low. When it's a single issue voter that can be you know riled up by Christopher Rufo and you know craziness from outside the state, they show up for masks. Who knows? They might come after us for Sherman Alexi novels. But by <laughs> and large, they don't care about the schools. Yeah, I think that's so. Any any ideas about? increasing meaningful engagement? Uh, I think some of what I shared is intended to do just that, because I think part of the disenchantment, if that's the right word, that people experience is that the cake is already baked, and why should I go on a Wednesday night to a school community meeting? They're, I already know what they're going to do. They've made their minds up. That may just be a part of it. I'm not saying that's everyone's reason for being disengaged. I think people are incredibly busy. I'm struck, you know, I mentioned my sister, like she has three kids. At one time they were in three different schools. She's as, as engaged as she can be working full time and just trying to keep her life afloat. And I think, again, thinking about your constituents, I think there are probably more parents like that than not who don't just have a random night to go and talk about 
the building project, even though it's going to cost them some money or not. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons why people in general are, are disengaged. Certainly COVID didn't help that in some ways, but I think also people's access to Zoom made that engagement easier for a lot of people. And that's why people are struggling now with should every school community meeting just stay on Zoom because people don't have to leave their living room and not cook dinner because they've got to come to this thing. No, I don't have a quick answer for that, but I think it is not uncommon and I think it is uh, indicative of something larger about the public's general sort of distrust and detachment from the public sector, if you will, and elected officials, unless they're going after something so, like you described, that is so, they're so passionate about that they'd give up anything to go there. The same superintendent I mentioned, Tom Pazon, earlier on, he, he's a teaching and learning guy. That's him. He's like, just cares about instruction and curriculum so much. Um, and he would say, I could cancel math and get a smaller turnout for the school committee meeting than if I fire the basketball coach tomorrow. <laughs> or if I change the name of the library because someone is attached to the name on that library. All, the, all these things about sports, certainly sports, <laughs> some of you know all too well, first and foremost. These other things that are definitely not immediately about teaching and learning get far more attention than the stuff that he and many of us are most passionate about, and that is actually what's being taught in the classrooms. So now that's coming to the forefront, but in ways that we certainly would not want in terms of banning textbooks and burning other books. And I'll, I will spare you the soapbox on that one. <laughs> other comments, questions, reactions? Yes. Please. We don't go a week without being compared to East Greenwich, and why can't we can't be more like you? <laughs> so maybe the lack of engagement means people think you're doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> to, to attend our meeting. You know, I didn't say that. I'm glad you did. I was like, <laughs> I saw some people in the room looking at him with envy, like, no one comes? <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, I'll, I'll leave you on that note. Thank you so much for your time today. I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to chat, but I really appreciate your, your work and your engagement today. Thank you.